everyone, and welcome to the New Earth Lawyer podcast. I'm Geraldine Jones Putra. I'm your host. I'm a lawyer myself. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia. On today's episode, I am speaking to Melissa Lyon. Mel is executive director and experience designer for Hive Legal, a boutique law firm based in Melbourne, Australia. She's a former lawyer and she is now an innovator. She won an award for Innovator of the Year last year. She is committed to improving the experience for those who receive legal services and for all of those who work in our industry. She consults on design thinking, innovation, legal operations, new law business models, and value pricing. She's also formerly a partner of a law firm and held senior business development roles at a top tier legal firm. Melissa, a wealth of experience you're bringing to us, and really I'm looking forward to a very interesting conversation. Welcome. Thanks so much, Geraldine. I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation um, off the back of a lot of interesting conversations that we've had in the past. Yeah. You know, I was saying to you before we started recording that uh, I wanted to get into an area of discussion that, that really is off the back of a discussion I had last week with Matthew Burgess of Few Legal, who's also, you know, he founded a, a niche law practice, a specialist law practice. And that was a discussion around innovation. Now, Hive Legal is an innovative law firm. I wanted to talk about what the innovations are that you, know, you have seen introduced in Hive. You've been there since day one. And why it doesn't actually have to be that hard to be effective. Yeah, look, it's a really good question. I, I think if you start from the beginning with Hive, um, the business model was innovative or is innovative in itself. Um, the, the fact that um, it was designed based on the founders' previous experiences of working in uh, bigger law firms uh, and, and what they did was really take, take, a back, or take a step back and look at how you would redesign the business model starting from scratch. So Hive had the ability to do that. And it, what, what components do you then put in that business model to um, allow it to improve the experience for not only its clients, but the people who work in the firm as well, as we like to call them Hivesters. Um, and, and those different components were innovative. Uh, things like value pricing. And I know you spoke to Matthew about that. So obviously, yeah. um, you know, Matthew would have talked about that, but value pricing, not having timesheets uh, and, and actually working with our clients to give them um, uh, certainty in their pricing, but also our lawyers not having to fill in timesheets so they can concentrate on the outputs. That was one of the innovative side of things, which has, and we can talk about this a bit later on, that has amazing benefits for the culture of the firm as well. Yeah, that's almost like the the first thing you'd want to change because yeah. it unleashes so much. And one of the things that I'm finding talking to different people about value pricing is that it's the start of the journey. It actually then leads to lots of other things that feeds into the innovation cycle. Absolutely. And, you know, we, when we talk about innovation, I think you know, a lot of people jump to it has to be tech based, it has to be big, wonderful, shiny, all of that type of thing. And coming back to your original question, how is Hive innovative? Well, that's one of the things changing the business model or changing the way that you're priced, changing the way that you work. Um, you know, our team totally um, flexible work practices. So no matter what role you play, how senior you are in the in at Hive, everyone has the choice of where and when they work. So um, you know, we've got an office in the CBD in Melbourne, um, but you you can choose where you want to work. If you want to work in the office, you can. If you want to work from home, if you want to work from a cafe. At the moment, I am working from my parents' house in northern Tasmania. Um, I'm very you know, jealous. There is real. Yeah, I know. It's an amazing view of that straight out here. Um, so, so those sorts of things. So, if you look at innovation, I think coming back to the original question, if you look at innovation um, from a people perspective, mm. and and have them as central to what you're doing, then part of my idea of innovation is that you are improving the experience for the people involved in what they're doing. Yeah. And if you're doing that, then you're innovating because you're um, making things better for them. It's an improvement. It could be 
um, efficiency wise, it could be well-being wise, it could be um, uh, profitability wise, different types of things. But it, if you're focusing on the people and making things better for the people, then I think you're innovating. And it you know, goes that, back to something that you've spoke to me about before, and that's the human centered design piece, yeah. because we are a human business. So it makes absolute sense. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's where I've been able to join the dots with, with my background. Um, and you mentioned before, practicing as a commercial litigator um, and, and then going into business development really gave me the opportunity to see, uh, to, to focus on the client or the customer's experience uh, and, and how they feel when they have, they're having legal services delivered to them. And so what I think you really have to do is think about those, think about the client as they are people. I know we're, we're providing um, advice to businesses, but at the end of the day, the people in those businesses are the ones that you are helping um, to make their lives better, to make their, um, uh, make, to get rid of their pain points. So if you're focusing on the people and the experience that they have working with you, then I think you're going to be a lot more successful in what you do. That's such an interesting point. It, it almost never has occurred to me. You know, there's this quote that does the rounds on the on the internet, a, a, a meme almost, right? Which is that people may forget what you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel or something like that. That is my go-to. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I, I use it, um, you know, in presentations and um, especially when I'm talking about business development. It is so important. And I think a fantastic development that we've seen in the last few years in the legal ecosystem is that people are starting to look at client and customer experience and employee experience. So quite a few years ago, we wouldn't have heard CX, EX being spoken about in the legal mm. context. Um, it is developing a lot more momentum now and we're seeing that. And so I see that as um, really central to that idea of innovation. If we've got the client experience, the employee experience, the user experience, the human experience wrapped up in what we're doing and having that as a focus, then we can innovate a lot more easily. And so I think to come back to that reason, why has the legal profession sometimes found innovation hard? I think often, it hasn't jumped to where it needs to jump to, which is looking at the people involved, the experience side of it. It's jumped to the tech, the efficiency side of things, as opposed to looking at the people that you're working with and working for. It's using the left brain, you know, that's what lawyers do. So when you say experience to me in the context of the legal profession, yes. I, I do immediately jump to, okay, we're going to make it uh, more cost effective for the client. You know, we're going to make it more streamlined, et cetera, et cetera. And then I forget about the right brain stuff, which is, well, how is the client feeling? You know, are they walking away thinking, oh, yeah, that was a good chat or that was a good experience or that was a good connection? Yeah. And that is actually so, so pretty basic, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. which means that you're, you're focusing then on the uh, psychology of your people and the psychology of your, your clients. Um, so what would be you know, an example of um, how you would say pitch to a client or how you would um, you know, introduce a new a new structure, a new idea to the client to take advantage yep. of that. Yeah. So I think, um, and once again, I think a benefit of our business model um, is that if, if you're looking at um, value and the value you're providing to a client, and also you have a structure where you have... Um, you don't have a lot of um, silos, silos and it's relatively flat hierarchy. Mm -hmm. The benefit of that is that um, you can bring a whole lot of skills to the way that you deal with or help your client. So you know, to use an example, um, in the traditional business model, a client might come with a, um, um, a, a, a legal problem that, that's a, um, a corporate 
legal problems. So the corporate group would, would deal with that and they would probably assist, they would assist the client, this is what we can do. If, if you're coming at it more at a holi- from a holistic point of view in terms of thinking right from the start, what is the client's problem? Not just the legal issue that needs to be solved for them, but actually their experience of how you're going to assist them, then there might be the need to bring in other skill sets to help with that. So it could be that there um, is a more efficient way of to help them to do that. So you could bring technologists in to do that. Or it could be, from my point of view, um, coming in and helping the client to design a better process to deal with the problem that they have using design thinking. So an example that I can use of that is that we've worked with clients where they have um, uh, contract approval processes that have been, you know, possibly paper-based or email-based. And we worked through through it using human-centered design to actually work out, um, you know, who was involved, what mattered to them, and then design a process which was a lot more iterative and also enabled them to collect the data around that as well. So it's sort of, to come back to your original question, we can bring a broader set of skills to the client's problem because we look at it not just from the point of view of delivering the technical legal advice but um, in a more in a more broad way and sitting behind all of that also is that you're not just billing on time absolutely thank you for bringing that up and i i missed that point too Absolutely, because if you're building on time in a traditional um, firm, then the clients will be charging by the, sorry, the the lawyers will be charging by the hour and it is their time that's their efforts that are put into this. If you go to, if when we go to a client and, or when a client comes to us, we will scope the matter for them. We will have those additional ideas for them that we can put to them in their options. And it's not based on the time that's going to be um, provided, and it's and it's not based on purely lawyer time. It's pr- it's based on what value we provide to them, and that value can include legal and non-legal um, input, op- um, operational assistance, yes. design assistance, mm. all of those things. Yeah, so, so this- coming back again to that experience side of it. Well. Now looking at the experience of of the people who work for Hive, and this was another area that I'm becoming increasingly fascinated by. It's that idea of, it's a cliche, bringing your whole self to work, being authentic. And I think, you know, looking back at my career, that it was very hard to be truly authentic in a very large law firm because there were expectations of how I would behave, what I would say, how I would dress and so on and so forth. What's the experience you're having at Hive in that (laughs) sense? Wow, so far (laughs) from that. (laughs) Um, Authenticity is another one of my go-to things. I I just think um, if, if you can't be authentic, then you're not, Um, reaching your full potential and I think the other side of authenticity is actually knowing why you do what you do and your purpose and I think if you're it's very hard often in a larger organization where you have those other um, preconceptions or, or ways of thinking to actually understand what either your personal purpose is or even the organization's purpose because it is often very large. So, you know, from from Hive's point of view, our vision or our purpose very much is improving the experience for our team and our clients. And that underpins everything that we do. My personal experience, my personal purpose is to bring all of that experience that I had previously throughout my career um, and learn from that and give back in a way to people who are coming into the legal ecosystem so that they can gain a fulfilling career much sooner than I did. I hear that a lot also. <laughs> you know, if, if only I'd know, no, no if the advice yeah. I could give to people, uh, start being yourself sooner, really. Uh, absolutely. But, you know, we're, we're in a very traditional for the most part, we're in a very traditional 
profession. I'll put it as a profession. And that that's where I was often frustrated, where that tradition really hinders your ability to A, bring your authentic self, B, be creative and, and use your authenticity to be creative. Because if you're running between the tracks, you're not thinking of all the things out there that you can bring in to change, make the change. And for me, that was the light bulb moment um, where I really saw how using a design thinking mindset where you, you talk about those higher levels, the concepts of collaboration, um, experimentation um, and empathy, bringing those into the way that, um, you know, we can practice law, we can provide um, solutions to our clients or we can treat each other within at, at, within our teams. Yeah. That's where the, that's where the, the secret source is around innovation because otherwise you'd, when you're working like this, it's like benchmarking, you know, if you're benchmarking against what everyone else is doing, no one's going to do anything different. And it's also uh, not just the, the individual has to be given the room to be themselves, but the structures then really need to be broken down because what's the point of telling people you can, you know, be yourself, you can you can say what you want, you can bring your hobbies to work, et cetera, et cetera. But then everything around them, all of the things that they, they are remunerated for, rewarded for, are guided towards, say, billing, yes, we know that, but also following a very traditional path, mm. right? So, and also within the firm, what happens is that, that we're rewarded within our silos and our business units. This is actually an extremely tough barrier to overcome if you've got those in place, because then you're not seeing true collaboration, as well as between, and we were talking about this earlier, allied staff and lawyers. Absolutely. Yes, because you've got those, they, they are literally barriers and silos. Um, hinder cross-pollination of thought, diversity mm -hmm. of thought across different skills. Uh, and if everyone's thinking the same way, then, you know, nothing's going to change or everyone thinks they have to think the same way. That's it. They think That's they have to think. Think the same way. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's interesting you should say that around career paths too, is that we're, we're at the moment we're a um, really exciting project at Hive is that we're reimagining and redesigning our career growth program. So, you know, we want to look at it from a, for a journey for any hivester who comes in to the to, to hive. Um, and, and we're asking them, you know, what, what do you see as success? What do you, what, what is your career going to be? What, you know, and, and so not is, this is what a senior associate does. This is what a special counsel does. This is what a lawyer does. Because to, to have the ability for people, and it comes back to my point about a fulfilling career. Um, do, is, is your career going to be that you are solely going to be a, um, a lawyer delivering legal advice? If that's, if that's what you want, fine. But if you also want to work with Mel and, and do design thinking or you know consulting or work on the operations part of it, and that's part of what makes you happy in your career path, then let's do that too. Yeah. So it, it's a, it's a, build your own journey, career journey and it doesn't have to look the same for everyone and in fact it shouldn't look the same for everyone if you really want to be in an innovative um, firm where you're really looking at how things can be done differently. Yeah so it's it's not top down and this is this touches on another conversation I had with someone around corporate new corporate structures right and we were talking about more flexibility, uh, reducing hierarchy and this was just so that these new form of companies could unleash purpose, you know, Absolutely. really uh, work with not just a top down purpose, but make sure that everybody was aligned. And it's absolutely the same with law firms. Uh, this, this, um, if you're going to, if you're going to harness energy from people, then you really need to know your people rather than make them fit a certain box. The other thing that I was going to ask you about was that, that, sense of um, when, when, when people are told that they can be themselves and, and be authentic, but then they're getting so many signals that they can't really, there's the sense of double speak and mm. what breaks down is trust. 
Mm. You're telling me I can. You're sending me off to all of these programs using big words like empowerment and so on. But I know that's not really the case. So, you know, there's the, the <laughs> trust is a massive thing. W words are cheap. Yeah. Actions are powerful. Uh, and uh, I think I think that's that's what what is really important in terms of the culture and and here you know I think what we're talking about too is very much that culture, culture yeah. and 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 you need and to have an innovative culture I think you need to have a culture where people have permission or I mean, not that they have permission they they feel empowered oh, here we're talking about words but but they it's inclusive so you know everyone can have a say and everyone can be heard that's the thing and be heard in a way that they want to be heard as well so look for another example Geraldine is today in fact we've gone out to our team we've got a, a we have a strategy day whole of firm strategy day every year mm. uh, and and we've gone out today and said to you to everyone Tell us what what you what you want to hear. You know, it can be fun, strategic. It can be um, serious. It can be you can bring other people in. But we want you to drive our strategy day. So we want everyone in the firm to you know contribute. What what session would you like to have? What would you like to deliver? And how are you going to and how are you going to do that? So that it, it's not just top down people saying this is what we're going to do it's much more around people being involved and having a say and driving it i think that's the other thing that's really important driving it so the project that i spoke to before, spoke about before which is called thrive at hive because we love our words <laughs> like that uh, you know our working team that we've got a working group that we've got working on that has um paralegals lawyers um senior associates um principals everyone's you know the working group has is representative of everyone yeah um and then we go out and and that will be very much getting everyone else's feedback as well so that in inclusiveness i think is really important so that strikes me as actually getting so much out of your people than you would in a traditional you need to build seven hours a day model because what's happening is they're thinking about it all the time every time they're going out maybe they're talking to their friends maybe they're reading something or, or they're, they're they're looking at linkedin or, or whatever it is right they they're, they're taking in, in new information and then they're considering well how could i take this back to hive to make it better for everyone. That is, you couldn't, you couldn't no. pay for that. That's totally priceless. It is. And, and I think coming back to that point about timesheets, if if people are looking at their value in terms of the time that they're mm. providing to the firm, so the firm value, your metrics are how much time you're putting down the timesheet, how that converts to fees, then that's what they will do. Obviously, if you're being measured that way, that's what you will do. Now, in that scenario, you're not going to necessarily have people going, oh, okay, well, I'll jump onto that working group or I'll develop that session for Hive because what they'll be thinking is oh, that's time that I won't be having on my timesheet. Yeah. Whereas with Hive, it is that's as much valued by the firm, the time that I spend helping build the culture of the firm, helping make the firm a better place, helping develop innovative ideas is is just as valued yeah and in fact in some ways even more <laughs> yeah so so it creates a culture where people are um you know they feel that, that they are um contributing and really making a difference and it's not purely time on the timesheet that's valued so when i speak to somebody like you in a new law firm and I have spent my entire career really in big law firms, I do think, well, what's the place then for the big law firms? You know, mm. You're unleashing so much potential, you're making clients happy, you're delivering high level, high quality legal services. Uh, and I, I do have some ideas to, to answer my own question, but I'm wondering what you think, what's the place for big law now? Oh, look, I think there will always be a place for big law. There will always be a place for big law. Mm -hmm. um, 
the sheer scale, the ability to put together big teams, highly specialised advice, um, you know, large scale litigation, large projects, all of those types of things where you've got, you need that scale. That's where big law yeah. will, always, will always have a place. Yeah. Um, Although they are under threat in those areas from obviously the big consulting firms, but that's a whole yeah. other conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, that is. Um, so I think, but I think, you know, big law does need to continue to look at um, how they work with the people within within their firms their teams how yeah. they how they provide um, a good experience for for those people um, I would like to think that business models like ours will continue to grow and have impact on the legal ecosystem because we are doing things differently and are focusing on both the client and the team experience in what we're doing Big Laura, though, is always going to be out there, I think, when you've got that, when you need that major scale or, or coverage to, to do those bigger matters. I get asked this question now uh, from young lawyers who are in major law firms. When would be the best time for me to make a career change, they ask. Mm. And I think the answer has changed a lot in the last few years. Mm. So I, I would have given a very pat stereotypical answer a few years ago saying, do your time, you know, get a few years under your belt, get the training, etc., put it on your CV. Um, and more recently, I'm saying, you know, are you feeling like you need to leave? You know, you've, you've been admitted, you've maybe done a couple of years, you want to leave? Well, there's lots out there for you. Absolutely. And I'm seeing that trend now too. I mean, we, there are, there are so many opportunities. And what I, what I say to, to students is if you feel like you, you want to give Big Laura a try, go for it, you know, give it a try. But also know that there are other opportunities out there, um, firms like ours, and we've had graduates come through who are now senior associates, um, you know, working in highly specialised regulatory areas of energy um, and um, government financial services and health. And, and they have come through and they're working with the same clients that they would be working in big law that we were working for in big law, yeah. um, but just with a, with a different business model, different structure that they're working from and a different way of approaching it. So they're still doing the same type of work. Um, so I see, I, I get a little bit frustrated, I suppose, when I see that people don't necessarily, uh, students don't necessarily see the new law firms as an option for them because they're a, it's absolutely an option for them. I think the other thing from the student's point of view too is, and I'll say to them is, don't think that you should you necessarily have to go into practicing law either. Think more broadly about whether or not you might enjoy working in more of a consulting space or you know an legal operations space or in, in within the legal ecosystem, but not necessarily as a practicing lawyer. Yeah. There, there are so many more allied professional type roles now that people might feel that they're they're better suited to D design. Um, legal design, all of those different types of, of things now that are available to people. And I think, you know, having having a broader opportunity to um, build your own career in a different way can start very early on, as you say. You don't have to be there for five, six years before you decide what you're going to do differently. Yeah. So I've started to let go of this idea of the advantage of training in a big law firm right which is a personal bias of mine I think mm. and I'm starting to think about this idea of more personalized apprenticeship training mm. and I wonder whether that's something that you're observing that that people who begin their training at Hive would get more of they just get yeah. a lot more personalized expert training from people who've got 25 30 years of experience I think that's right. Um, I think, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, that that's the benefit that you get in a smaller environment. Yeah, sure. yeah. It's just a different um, way of training. It is a different, different way of training. Just as valid. Yeah. 
It, it is interesting, though, because when, when we first started at Hive, we were one of the first firms to be working remotely. And so a lot of the questions that we would be asked all the time is, how do you know if your people are working? How do you train them? How do you do this? It was that complete bias, as you're saying, to if they're not in front of me, sitting in the office in front of me, and I'm not seeing them filling in timesheets, do I know they're actually doing it? But in fact, what what um, working in a remote way means is you're even more hypersensitive, if I can put it that way, to ensuring that you are training people, that you're that you're keeping in touch with them, that you are seeing, you know, what they need, because you you know that you're not going to see them in the office every day. So you, it really was from the start we're investing a lot of time and effort into working out how you how we train people, how we feel that let them know that they're supported and how they develop their careers as well. And how long has Hive been going now, if I may ask? Seven years. Seven, Seven years. years. So what what next? Oh, you've got um, your Thrive programs. Uh, I was intrigued to hear about your strategy day. Uh, what do you think is the next is the next step up for Hive? Yeah. Um, I think for us, it will be continuing to develop our consulting oh. side of things that we do. So, so that's very much, um, I mean, obviously continue to grow our, our other areas that, that we, that we um, um, provide legal services in those highly regulated areas that I was talking about before. Um, so, so looking at the consulting space, so design, legal design thinking, looking at process improvement um, and continuing I think to do what we've been doing at Hive for a number of years now which is providing clients with um, an outsourced legal service um, outsourced legal service um, provision through our Hive GC plus model which is where it's not like a secondment it, it's more where clients come to us with uh, a need for resourcing but we can provide it in the firm so rather than putting a secondee in to them we'll actually provide that service from to them from everyone within the team that, that has the skills that are required and um and assist them with that on an ongoing basis so we've got a number of hive gc plus clients now that that we um we work for and that system's working really well so would you say that with your legal design thinking practice and skills would you say that hive is doing more in the space of redesigning law than just redesigning hive like you're actually yeah. spreading the love if you like <laughs> absolutely <laughs> spreading the love um, and that's part of the consulting um, part of what we're doing too so for us bringing our experience of, of what we did with redesigning uh, the business model and how we work we work with um, other law firms to assist them with their strategic development, work with regulators to assist them with um, the, um, the strategy for their committees mm. um, on a number of different states, um, state legal regulators we're, we're working with as well. So what we like to think is we're, we're bringing that experience of what we're doing differently to help other others do things differently as well. So that includes, as I said, regulators uh, it includes our clients uh, it includes other law firms as well so yeah bringing that knowledge and understanding of the legal ecosystem uh, and business models and operations and what it is to deliver legal services wrapping that all up into much more of a holistic service uh, and and providing that to clients i love that that's true collaborative thinking you know it's really moving the profession forward together mm -hmm. So, Mel, thank you. Thanks so much for sharing. Uh, I've learned more about Hive and um, I remain very impressed. So good luck with all of it. Thanks, Geraldine. It's been a pleasure.